My father was the BBC's first ever reporter. He started work in 1936 and they called him an observer. He then became the BBC's first war correspondent and he went to the Middle East, he flew with Bomber Command and he went with the British Fourth Army under General Montgomery into Europe following D-Day. And he had witnessed a huge amount during that period of what war was really like. And he had a report that came back to the army group that he was with, referring to a place, a village called Bergen Belsen. And he decided that he ought to go and see what was happening there because reports were coming out from that part of the village on the outskirts of the village that became notorious throughout the world as the Belsen concentration camp. Inside Belsen, the horror that had been perpetrated, the individuals emaciated, starving, staggering along, inside one of the huts, peering out women who were skeletal. He'd never witnessed anything like that before. He'd witnessed war. He'd seen combat. He'd seen dead bodies. This was evidence of a mass murder. And these people, because there was typhus in the camp, were dying in huge quantities, as they had been in the other concentration camps across Europe. But this was the first camp to be liberated by the British Army. And he was the first individual as a reporter to witness the full horror. So he was entirely devastated by what he saw. You can hardly imagine if you didn't know about it before, what it meant until you saw it and he saw it. There had been reports from elsewhere, other camps beforehand, one notably from Auschwitz, but that had been uh, very uh, underplayed so that the American audience for which it was designed apparently wouldn't be too shocked by the atrocity of the detail. My father came out from Belsen and went back to where they uh, had congregated. And he was with a colleague who was another BBC correspondent called Winford, Winford Vaughan Thomas. And he wrote his piece. Winford said, I've never seen Richard looking so shocked. He wrote his piece and sent it back to London. And as Winford told me, got a message back saying, we need corroboration of this. We need someone else. We need some other organization to say this has happened. Otherwise, we can't broadcast it. It's too terrible. My father was absolutely furious when he got this message. So you have to remember, he was a very experienced war correspondent, probably the best known of all the BBC's correspondents. And for the office in London to say, we can't transmit this unless you provide us with some alternative evidence that it's true, was just too much for him. And he said, he said in words, effectively, if you don't put this broadcast out, I will never broadcast again in my life. And the BBC relented and it went out and of course, I was a tiny child at the time, but I know from people who've told me many, many people afterwards that when you heard it, just listening in your home, just on the radio, nothing else, no pictures, just the words, they never, ever forgot what he said. I have just returned from the Belzen concentration camp, where for two hours I drove slowly about the place in a jeep with the chief doctor of Second Army. I had waited a day before going to the camp so that I could be absolutely sure of the facts now available. I find it hard to describe adequately the horrible things that I've seen and heard, but here, unadorned, are the facts. There are 40,000 men, women and children in the camp. 
German and half a dozen other nationalities, thousands of them Jews. Of this total of 40,000, 4,250 are acutely ill or dying of virulent disease. Typhus, typhoid, diphtheria, dysentery, pneumonia, and childbirth fever are rife. 25,600, three quarters of them women, are either ill from lack of food or are actually dying of starvation. In the last few months alone, 30,000 prisoners have been killed off or allowed to die. Those are the simple, horrible facts of Belsen. But horrible as they are, they can convey little or nothing in themselves. He used words clearly and simply to describe what he saw. He didn't elaborate. He didn't overstate it. It was quite spare, quite bare and was, in my view, a piece of, perhaps beautiful is the wrong term to use in this context, but a beautiful description because of its power, its simplicity, and its unequivocal, unchallengeable evidence, which is why it was also important as well as overwhelming. He worked for the BBC. He was naturally a believer in the BBC's values of being accurate, 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 impartial, telling the truth, unvarnished, however difficult it was. And we live in a world now where people can say anything it can be true, false, half true. It can be cruel, it can be kind. And we are in a much more difficult environment through social media to judge what is true and what is not. It's, you can read something, hear something, and you think, yes, that's very powerful, I like that. It could be the most disgusting propaganda. It could be completely concocted. It could be an extraordinary insight. And therefore we have to filter and judge today what we are hearing and seeing in a way that it was much easier in those days because the outlets were much fewer and on the whole, of course there were mistakes made, on the whole accuracy and truth-telling was held to be preeminently important. We live in a world now where it is often very difficult to distinguish the truth from falsehood. We have political leaders who go out of their way to tell lies while claiming that those who are telling the truth are lying. It makes it very difficult for people unless they've got a, a huge amount of time to examine the evidence to judge what is true or what is false. And I do think it's much more difficult now, but I think therefore education that is based on fact and isn't just prejudicial statements, statements of I think this, I feel that, Feelings are important, don't misunderstand me, but feelings aren't the same in terms of understanding what happened isolated from the facts. They have to be with the evidence. And the evidence of the Holocaust is overwhelmingly compelling. You cannot make it up. The evidence is there and it serves as an extraordinarily important warning. My father was a perfectionist. He worked very hard. He always did his homework. He wanted to be accurate. He had a gift for words. The words came naturally. They flowed easily. And I don't think that that can be taught. You can work at it. But uh, the essence of it is something that I think that all people have the potential to have, which is Say it simply, say it truly, say it accurately. And don't strive for effect. Don't work at trying to uh, make people f think something or feel something. Tell them how it is. Let them uh, 
feel as a consequence of what you've said that you're telling a truth and that it matters. You can't do that by making it up. And ranting is a disaster in my view. The more young people can understand what the media is, how it works, whether to trust it or whether not to trust it, whether to be part of it or not, the more pe young people are aware of that, the better. You know, we live in a world where the media is all about us. We are constantly bombarded with information, with thoughts, with opinions, with argument, with debate, uh, with images. And if we just sort of observe them and don't, uh, it's, a, it's a sort of long word to use and a boring word, if we don't interrogate them, if we don't say, hang about, what's that person really saying? What does that picture really tell us? Do I trust that person? How do I, what, what do I use inside myself? What, what's the, what criteria do I use in order to assess whether what I'm being told is valid, whether it's reasonable, whether it's fair? whether it's true, whether it's accurate. Those things are fundamentally important. And so my own strong view is that the more young people um, can bring themselves, you know, people are busy, they've got all sorts of stuff to do, um, but everyone has one of these in their hands. Judging what is true, what is false in social media is critically important and never to be overwhelmed by it so you can think of nothing else except what the last person said on there to you. It's also very important. I hope that young people hearing those words and having, as I know they have, amazingly strong imaginations will say to themselves, I might have witnessed that. How would I have felt? How would I have seen it? And I hope they might think, I'm glad I've heard that because it tells me something that I need to know.